California Election Day is November 8th, but actually, voting begins next week. In addition to voting for L.A.'s mayor and a host of statewide offices, voters have to make a choice on several statewide propositions. Some of them are pretty confusing. Hello, everyone. I'm Hal Eisner. Welcome to Fox 11 News in Depth. And this week, we're going to try and talk about these propositions, three of them in particular, and see if we can separate fact from fiction and do it in a sort of unfiltered way. Our goal is not to confuse, but to clarify. We're not going to offer up advocates for each side, but rather strive to keep this as, as simply informative as we possibly can. Emily Hoven is the newsletter editor for Cal Matters. Thanks for being with us, Emily. And uh, boy, there's a, there's a lot of window dressing on these ads here. So, so let's start off this way. Let's not assume that everybody knows what Cal Matters is. So what is Cal Matters? We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan state room that's focused on state politics and policy. We cover the governor, the state legislature, state agencies, and we also focus heavily on elections um, and statewide ballot propositions, which is makes it perfect for our discussion today. And and doesn't Cal Matters have something to do with these sort of explanations of of uh, ballots that we get in the mail? Yeah, we have a very comprehensive voter guide. I would say the most comprehensive in the state that breaks down all of the statewide offices and elections that people are being asked to vote on, as well as propositions. And if you go to our website, calmatters.org, and look at our voter guide, we have videos explaining each of the propositions in about one minute. We have an interactive game that you can play to figure out um, which side you're on on some of these com confusing ballot measures. Um, and we have very detailed campaign finance information as well to help you understand who's funding these measures and how they got on the ballot. I'm glad you have a simplified game because this is a very complicated game. And two of the propositions that people seem to be struggling with concern gambling. Now, this is both gambling in person and gambling online. That's Proposition 26 and 27. So we're going to start with Proposition 26 in this segment, move to 27 in the next one. But, but what's that all about? What is Proposition 26? And again, we're not going to kind of blow commercials at you. We just want to get to what is this thing? Right. So we will do our best to distill this complex measure down. So uh, Proposition 26 is a measure that is funded by a large coalition of Native American tribes, um, and it would allow those tribes um, and California's four horse race tracks to offer in-person sports betting. It would also expand the number of games that tribal casinos can offer um, to some roulette games and some dice games. Um, and it would also give... Um, the people more power to um, get, have lawsuits against people that they believe are breaking the state's gambling laws. Um, so those are some of the key aspects of, of the measure. Um, and ever since the United States Supreme Court gave states the power to authorize sports betting in their states, California, um, there's been an ongoing battle in California over what that should look like and who should control it. Um, and California's seen as sort of the mother load because of how big the state is and how much revenue it could bring in. So this is a very high dollar and high profile fight. Yeah, that's a lot to unpack right there. The, the thing about lawsuits, just, just explain that real quick. Yes. So um, this proposition would base, so th this right now, the State Department of Justice would be in charge of basically fining and prosecuting people that are breaking the state's gambling laws. But this measure would also allow other parties to bring those lawsuits um, if the Department of Justice declines to act or if they the case is refiled. Um, and this, basically, Native American casinos have made no secret of the fact that they would use this measure to basically bring lawsuits against card rooms, which are one of their main competitors um, when it comes to gambling in California. California. Um, and there have been some back and forth over, you know, which games card room should be allowed to offer and how they should offer them. And so this, you know, critics of the measure are saying that this is basically a way for the tribes to bring a lot of lawsuits against these card rooms and potentially drive them out of business and reduce some of their competition in this aspect. And, and so am I right in, in, I had a strange factoid in my brain that, that right. California card rooms are mentioned in the California Constitution. I actually am not sure about that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I heard at one point they were protected here in the state. So it sounds to me like this is sort of a, 
a measure that can pit this against that. But I'm a voter, and I'm worried about, am I doing the right thing? So as a voter, I'm allowing what to occur here? You are allowing people to um, walk into tribal casinos and walk into horse race tracks and place in-person um, bets on on sports sport, sporting events. Um, and this would not include youth sporting events. Um, to add a horse race track, you would have to be 21 or older in order to place these bets in person. Um, and when it is in a tribal casino, the age would actually depend um, on each casino because the, tri the Native American tribes have what are known as these compacts with the state that basically regulate their business and so they would have to negotiate with the state what that age um that minimum age would be for you to walk in and be able to place that bet i have to ask you about horse racing you know there are animal advocates who say it would increase interest in horse racing which they're actually trying to diminish so you know what's your take on that yeah, no, that that has been an aspect of this race. The animal advocates and people that, you know, are very supportive of animal welfare oppose this um, because they think, you know, horse bets on horse horse racing in California have been declining over time, but they're afraid that this could essentially kind of bring that back. And there has been a lot of high profile deaths of, of races on horse tracks, especially in Santa, Santa Anita, I believe. Um, and so there are some concerns that this would kind of lead to that practice that they say endanger horses welfare. And when we come back, what we're going to do, Emily, and she's saying, with us of course we're, we're going to look at 27 and then we'll kind of like at the very end of that talk about 26 versus 27 so coming up next on fox 11 news in depth we'll talk more about these propositions and emily hoven will continue to stay with us we'll be right back Welcome back to Fox 11 News in Depth. I'm Hal Eisner. And let's welcome back Emily Hoven, who's with Cal Matters. And, you know, Emily, we talked about the idea that Proposition 26 basically expands the gambling room to include dice and, and blackjack and, and, and roulette games and, and things like that, that that aren't really allowed in California now. So what, what did 27 do and what's the difference between these two? Yes, so Proposition 27 is sort of this dueling sports betting measure. Um, and this one was funded primarily by large online gambling companies like DraftKings, FanDuel and BetMGM, which together already control about 73% of the online betting marketplace in the United States. And so they are hoping to expand that into California with sports betting. And this measure would basically allow online sports betting. And the other measure was only in person. This one is online and it also includes um, Native American tribes. It would allow Native American tribes by themselves to offer online and mobile sports betting outside of tribal lands. And it would also allow large online companies to offer online sports betting as long as they make a deal with a Native American tribe to do so. Now, um, I, I and, have to ask you, I have to, we're looking at a video there of people playing roulette on their computers and people playing slot machines on their computers. It's not just sports betting, it is those games on your computers as well? I believe they also that that would be part of this larger conversation about in the future potentially expanding to other games. Um, I'm not. I'm actually not entirely sure if that's included in the sports betting one, but I I think it's sports betting. Um, and but it would also include other betting in terms of um, on awards shows and even on video games. Wow. You know, one of the things that, that you mentioned, DraftKings and a couple of those apps right there, uh, they're dying to get into California, aren't they? Absolutely. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, California is, is thought to be the most lucrative market in the United States just because of the sheer size of the population. And we have so many sports teams here um, in California. And so I think this represents, you know, a massive opportunity for these companies that have already established themselves in other states in the country. So 26 is in the casinos, 27 is online, which can be on your phone or on, on a computer. But can I vote for both of those? You can vote for both of them. And um, there is sort of some confusion about what would happen if both of them are actually passed by voters. Um, the, pro the proponents of Prop 27 say that their measure does not at all conflict with Prop 26. And so if both passed, 
both to go into effect, but Prop 26 supporters seem less sure that that is the case. And so what I think would happen is that we would see some sort of court battle if both of these were to go into effect in terms of which one would be allowed to and what the scope of that would be. So it's very complicated, but I do want to note that um, it's looking more and more unlikely that that will happen. There was a poll that came out this week from UC Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Studies that found that both propositions are significantly underwater with voters. Um, Prop 26 had just 31% voter support, and for Prop 27, it only had 27%. I think part of it has to do with the complexity we've been talking about, and the poll also found that voters saw a bunch of these ads, they were more likely to vote no than people that had not seen the ads. Uh, and I think that just speaks to how confusing um, these propositions are and understanding how they may or may not interrelate with each other. So I have to ask you, I mean, we see in these ads things about, we're going to fund the homeless, we're going to help the homeless, we're going to give money to homeless service agencies. I, I need you to break that down. I mean, I, I was reading in the San Francisco Chronicle that it could be a massive amount of money that goes to homeless agencies, but in some cases, homeless agencies aren't that interested. So clear this up for us. Yeah, so one of the messages behind Prop 27 is that they are saying that this measure, if it's passed by voters, would essentially create a permanent funding stream for homelessness and mental health programs here in California um, and give hundreds of millions of dollars annually to do so. The reality is likely to be a little bit more complicated. Um, according to the state's independent legislative analyst, which is also nonpartisan, they found that Proposition 27 would likely result in hundreds of millions of dollars annually in state revenue but no, likely not more than $500 million. And of that money, tens of millions of it would have to go toward regulating sports betting. And then of that, 85% would go to homelessness and 15% would actually go to Native American tribes who are not involved in the online sports betting marketplace. And so when you kind of subtract all of those things, let's say it only brings in $400 million a year, but you have to spend you know, $200 million on enforcement, and then you have to give a certain amount to the tribes, You know, it could end up not being hundreds of millions every single year for homelessness, but there would always be some amount of money that goes that goes towards it. Uh, why would it be that some homeless agencies might not be supporting this? Well, I think that some might not suppose might not support this because they are kind of against the concept that these out of state online betting companies would be coming into California and actually only 10% of so they 10% of the bets that are placed would be sent to the state and then 90% would be, you know, kept by the companies is what critics is what critics say and of that 10% tax placed on each on each bet the companies would actually be allowed to deduct certain expenses from that 10% tax, including any bet that is placed with a, with a promotional credit. Um, and the proposition also explicitly says that the state, although it would be given the power to regulate this industry, it would not be give, given the power to limit the amount of promotional credits that these companies give to people to place bets. So they could theoretically deduct a fair amount of money um, from that in order to limit the amount of money they actually have to give to the state in, the ta in taxes. And so I think there are some advocates who say that, you know, they're basically using the homeless as a pawn to get voter support, but in reality, it's not giving as much as it could or it should. There is so much to unpack. And so, you know, I'm going to encourage people to look at their voter guides because you've <laughs> given us kind of like an essence, but, you know, there's, there's just a lot of unpack on both of these propositions and even underage gambling, which we didn't have time to talk about. So, Emily Hoven, thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again. And coming up next on Fox 11 News In Depth, we take a look at another controversial proposition, which would add new taxes to provide incentives for zero emission car purchases and help with wildfire abatement. We're back with an expert to talk about all of that and if it all promises to be what it promises to be right after the break. Don't go away. As we just saw from Propositions 26 and 27, this stuff can get very complicated. So now let's tackle Proposition 30. It would raise the state's personal income tax on high earners and spend that extra cash 
on incentives for electric vehicles and wildfire prevention. That all seems very clear cut. Joining us to try to help us be sure it is, is Nadia Lopez. She's with Cal Matters as well. She's their environment reporter. And thanks for joining us, Nadia. Appreciate it. It's great to be here. Kel, explain this stuff to us. Prop 30 would do something if voters approved it. What would it do? That's right. So the state recently uh, passed a regulation, the California Air Resources Board, to ban all new sales of gas cars by 2035. So that means any uh, car company, uh, dealership, manufacturer that wants to operate in California has to sell electric vehicles uh, in 2035 and moving forward. So that being said, Prop 30 would impose a 1.75% income tax on Californians making more than 2 million per year. And it's in an effort to fund a whole suite of climate programs, but specifically 80% of the money that's generated through the tax would go towards rebates and grants for low to middle income people to be able to purchase an electric vehicle and also building out charging infrastructure across the state, which is very much needed. Yeah, I think it's a fair statement that nobody likes a sentence that begins with raise taxes, but the tax right. increase here would, would really not affect most Californians, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, there is a significant portion of people who do make uh, two million a year, but it's not at all your average Californian and um, most people across the state. Yeah, and as you pointed out, the biggest part of this tax revenue would go towards supporting zero emission vehicles. Why don't you explain that a little bit? It's not just rebates. Yeah, so basically um, for a lot of people, purchasing a new car, an electric vehicle especially, is still very much out of reach. Um, they can range anywhere from $40,000 to upwards of $100,000. Um, so the hope is that, you know, by putting more money into these grant and rebate programs, uh, that the state will be able to help more people also be able to afford electric cars. And those grant and rebate programs can provide up to about $7,000 to $9,000 towards the purchase of an electric car. So for your average Californian, it would make a big difference in being able to afford that. There, there are opponents to this, including uh, Governor Newsom, who's been very, vi very high visibility on this thing as, as being against it. Uh, why would people be against this if California is moving more towards electric vehicles? Yeah, you know, so um, Governor Gavin Newsom is one of the main opponents as well as the Republican Party. But apart from that, people say, look, California is a really expensive place to live already. Um, people don't need more tax hikes. In addition, some people think that this is, you know, solely being funded by a special interest that would benefit from it, um, rideshare companies such as Lyft. So um, Lyft, for example, has to log 90% of its miles um, in EVs pretty soon, actually, within the next few years. And this would obviously not help Lyft directly, but it would help people who drive for Lyft uh, would need to either drive an EV or a hybrid vehicle in order to be able to operate under Lyft um, according to that mandate. So people are saying that, you know, in addition to high cost of living, who is this really going to benefit? Is it going to benefit the people or is it going to benefit a special interest? You know, so yeah, we're so dependent, though, on, on uh, for many, uh, for rideshare programs and uh, even delivery of food at home. I call that room service, but uh, that's, that's my way of dealing with the expense. But, but you know, how do they get involved in this? How did Lyft get involved in this? Yeah, how do, how do these rideshare programs get more engaged? Is it getting more well, electric vehicles or what is it? I mean, Lyft wouldn't necessarily benefit directly from it, the company itself, but they do realize that, you know, this, this, measure would help fund all of these sort of incentives over the next 20 years. So it would help provide up to $100 billion until 2045. Um, so they really think that those funds could go towards many of their drivers who are interested in purchasing vehicles. I have, to ask, you, I have to ask you, though, about wildfire prevention, 
and mitigation right. because we only have a few seconds left here. Can you address that real quick? Yeah, so about 20% would go towards the hiring, retention, um, and also training of firefighters. And that's in an effort to really help uh, the state battle wildfires as they become more extreme. All right, Nadia Lopez, thanks so much. Boy, we, we have a lot to learn, don't we, this election season? <laughs> that's right, a lot right. going on. All right, thanks so much. And we'll be back with more Fox 11 News in depth right after this break. Don't go away. Cal Matters has broken down more of the ballot propositions on their website, which is really a very handy feature. Let's take a look at one of them. The landscape of abortion access is rapidly shifting across the United States. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June, ending a nearly 50-year-old constitutional right to abortion, Republican-led states have rushed to restrict the procedure or ban it altogether. California is moving even further in the opposite direction. This November, we'll be advancing a constitutional amendment. Democratic leaders want to make the state a sanctuary for abortion, welcoming patients from across the country who no longer can terminate their pregnancies at home. And now, California voters have a chance to enshrine reproductive rights in the state constitution. Hi, I'm Alexi Kosef, state capital reporter for Cal Matters, and this is Proposition One in a Minute. Abortion access isn't going away in California anytime soon. The procedure has been legal here since 1967. Currently, you can get an abortion for any reason before a fetus is viable at about 24 weeks of pregnancy. California's constitution even includes a right to privacy that state courts have interpreted as protecting abortion. But with the end of Roe, Democratic leaders want greater assurances that abortion access won't be threatened by shifting political tides. They placed a state constitutional amendment before voters declaring that people have a right to choose to have an abortion and a right to choose or refuse contraceptives. Critics say the amendment would not offer any new protections and that it's merely a ploy to turn out liberal voters. But supporters argue an explicit guarantee of reproductive freedom is important in case legal interpretations of California's constitutional right to privacy change. Anti-abortion advocates also say the language is so broad that it would legalize late-term abortions beyond the 24-week point of viability. Proponents deny that. So vote yes if you want California to add a fundamental right to choose an abortion in the state constitution. Vote no if you don't. For more information on this proposition and others, visit calmatters.org. And, of course, that was about Proposition 1. Finally, if you haven't already, check out my podcast. It's called What the Hell, and it's available wherever you subscribe to podcasts or just go to whatthehellpodcast.com. That's it for this week's Fox 11 News In-Depth. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week, everybody. We'll have more on the propositions coming up in the weeks ahead, and we'll see you next time.